morning and welcome to As Goes Wisconsin on this sunny, sunny day, at least here in Waukesha. Calvin is with us on the board. Greg Buck with me in studio and you at 844-967-2789-844-96. Party. Thank you, Greg Buck. If you ever want to call and or text or check in, you can also watch us on the uh, live stream on YouTube, Facebook, and on Twitter, you can leave a comment there as well. We will see that as it crosses the line. We have a really, really busy show coming up today. Uh, joining us at 1033, the one and only Joe Zapecki will be here. We're going to start by kicking around the Supreme Court announcement yesterday that they've come out with a code of ethics. Okay. <laughs> I find that kind of supremely hilarious. And, uh, <laughs> I see what you did there. See, And uh, we will talk with Joe about that. Johnny Watermullen, our very own Johnny, Wa Johnny Watermullen, is going to join us at 1133. He is heading up to Deer Camp later this week, and he is going to share some Deer Camp stories. I would like you to start thinking about yours and uh, have you share them as long as we can air them. <laughs> 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 they, can't, they have to be, you know, they can't be obscene uh, or, or in include dirty words. Yeah. But All right. PG-13 PG, stories. Yeah, PG-13 stories. Actually, you know what? I'll say PG because you can do a lot of PG-13 movies nowadays. Yes, you can. Yeah. PG stories about what happens at Deer Camp. We will take your calls coming up at 1133. Uh, first off, though, I wanted to start with this. Yesterday, we had Mark Semmerhauser here from the Wisconsin Policy Forum, and we were talking about housing needs in Wisconsin and the fact, and it's not just in Wisconsin, but really across the country, on how birth rates are down. We just yeah. aren't having as many children as we used to. And this has been happening over several decades. It's not like it's just, you know, in the last five years or anything. And there are a number of different reasons for that. But as I was on Twitter last night, I ended up going down this Twitter hole. <laughs> and it it led it inspired me to do a special more words from men segment. Oh, on why the birth rate is declining in America. For example, this is what I saw on Twitter yesterday from a guy. These are the causes of plummeting birth rates in America, Greg Bach. Birth control. Mm, abortion. Of course. Hookup culture. Yes. People wasting time in long-term relationships for years on end without making a commitment. Or as I call them, losers. Yes. Feminist brainwashing of young women. Mm, yes, the feminists. Dudes with low T and decreased sperm counts. Nothing makes me believe a story more than when someone uses the word dudes. Dudes. Vaccines. Of course. And the significant increase in things like the LGBTQ plus community, <laughs> climate change, kids are bad for the environment, nonsense, etc. This I, went on. <laughs> this thread went on and on and on and on. Until a woman finally commented. What? And said, it's almost like society needs to start asking women what they need in order to feel comfortable and are willing to increase the number of children they have on top of that to potentially stay home with them. But more words from men on the subject. Guy responds to her, no, we need to stop deferring to what women want. Oh, God, this makes me hurt inside. You give women control over the direction of society and civilization collapses. We are seeing this in real time. Women have a function. They are not performing that function to the degree, the, to the degree they need to be. Oh, man, I don't. So how many, how many children do you have? Me? Much, no, I, oh. to, to anyone who's listening or watching on the stream, how many kids do you have? Would you have wanted to have more if you could? Or if you only have two, why did you stop at two? I would like to know why you made the decisions about your family size the way you did. 844-967-2789, 844-96-PARTY. So... How many? There. How many are? How many? So you got five. I have five siblings. There's all together. There's six of you all together. There's six. My mother was pregnant eight times. Okay, so six all together. Do you know how many children? How many siblings your mother had or father had? Like, did they come from big families? On um, the other side? My father came from a big family. I think they had six. My okay. father. My mother came from a small family. They only had two. Okay, because like, so my dad's family. 
my great grandfather, he came from, he was like one of 13 or 15. Okay. Then my grandpa was one of 10. My father was one of seven. I am one of two. I just feel like we're living in the day and age where one, you, okay. You want to have the many kids, have the many kids. I don't think that's your, I don't think that's whatever, what I think is irrelevant, but I feel like when you come from that place of like, Oh, I, I come from seven, eight siblings. I don't want that many. It just seems like that's what more people are doing. Well, I think there are so many other considerations to keep in mind, especially with the cost of things. Oh, my good gravy. Yes. Right. I mean, that is certainly going to be affecting people's decisions on whether or not to increase their family size. Yeah, I think that it also I mean, it's it's an increase in cost. It's also they've you know, having more children is an increase on your carbon footprint. You're, You're using up more energy and there's more. It just it just. Once again, you want to have a lot of kids, that's fine. But there there are knock-on effects. Absolutely. 844-967-2789. How many children do you have? Good morning, Laura, joining us from Wisconsin Rapids. Hi, Laura. Hi. Hello. How, how, how big is your family, Laura? I am a single mother of four. Did you plan on four? Did, you, that, did you hope for four? Absolutely not. Um, so the way that happened was I was married once upon a time and we were evangelical Christians. And so the, the, you know, go forth and prosper, multiply that business. We were very good at it uh, (laughs) while we were together for seven years. Um, but then I got divorced and ended up pregnant a fourth time. And when it comes down to it, I'm pro-life for my own body. Yeah. But. I also have matured enough to know that that's just me. I don't need to tell the neighbor lady to do that also. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's, it's your personal decision. It's your personal choice. It's your body. Right. I, I just, when I, when I started looking at this Twitter feed yesterday, Laura, it was remarkable to me how many men are the experts on why women aren't having enough babies. And it's interesting that you mentioned that you were an evangelical because one of the comments posted on this thread, there is no excuse to not have unlimited children. If you are a follower of Christ, you should not be using birth control. Every time you come together with your wife, which should be frequent, frequently, unless you drink soy, pray for conception. I'm tired of seeing three kid Christian families after they've been married for 20 years. It- Listen, okay, so we were only married for five, so bam, 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 together for seven, married for five. But also, that's what the culture was. Like, note, I am no longer evangelical Christian. I was when I was married. And so that's just what the culture is. Like, shoot, I attended several sermons uh, just about voting pro-life and how it is your duty and responsibility as a Christian and as a member of this church community. But Laura, what does that do to women in the community or couples in the community who have reproductive issues? Exactly. I mean, they must have so must... many friends that had reproductive issues and they, they spent time with me and my family to try and like enjoy being around kids because they felt such a gap in their life, a hole in their life because they didn't have kids because it felt so much like the thing she was supposed to be doing. And if you can't do it, that's like, well, then that's, isn't that, then God is not showing you favor. I mean, that's just, Oh my good girl. Not not only that, but but they feel like failures. I like, I, I have had too many conversations with, and this is when I was 25. Like I was, I was young. These women were young that I was talking to about this just tortured by it because it, they felt like they were being denied what they were intended to do. That, that breaks like, my I'm heart. It, it, that really, it really, that just breaks my heart that through no fault of your own, you are, and then you're made to feel like you're a failure because you weren't able to do this. Laura, thank you so much for calling. Really appreciate it. 844 967 2789. How many kids do you have? Uh, John from the Falls checking in on the text line. Good morning, everybody. I have two boys I love very much. I wouldn't say I have too many, but I would say I have enough. <laughs> we also had a comment on the live stream from Joseph McClear. Oh, he said, buddy, Joe. 
I wanted 12 kids so I could challenge my buddy Dan's family to a football game every year, 11 plus a kicker. Uh, we are currently at two. We'll see how that winds up. Uh, l- l- let me know what your wife thinks of that whole uh, idea too there, Joe. All right. Uh, Salient point. Exactly. Uh, I, I just wanted to, I prepared something for you for this whole thing. I, I, I got something for you. I'm excited. Uh, can you play it, uh, Calvin? Oh, I think we missed this. More words. Yep, there it is. From men. There you go. There you go. 844-967-2789. How many kids do you have? Again, this goes back to this Twitter feed that I followed yesterday, and I was down, I followed this down the rabbit hole. Uh, Man posts on Twitter, my grandmother had her first at 22, her second at 24, her third at 26, for example. Another man replies to that and says, well, her generation was probably the last one that consistently had children early, and they could afford to do so. I just don't understand these, like... These seem like villains in a movie. Like, it's just like to have the temerity to be like, well, the, because of soy and <laughs> the lesbians and Joe Biden. I just like, this is almost, it, it, once again, I'd be laughing if it, were, it weren't were real, if this was a movie, but this is for real. And these men have the absolute audacity to say things that they're saying. And I just... Really, it makes me so, so angry. We're going and- to keep this going. Stay with us. Karina, I see you on the line. Don't go away. 844-967-2789. How many children do you have? Stay with us. You're listening to As Goes Wisconsin on the Civic Media Radio Network. Good morning. Welcome back to As Goes Wisconsin. Jane Matt there in for Kristen Bry. Calvin is on the board. Greg Bach with me in studio. And you can join us at 844 844- Nine six seven two seven eight nine eight four four nine six. Party. We're talking about more words from men. Yesterday, we had Mark Summerhauser on from the Wisconsin Policy Forum, talking about housing in Wisconsin in particular, and about birth rates. And birth rates just across the country have been in decline for several decades. I fell down this Twitter rabbit hole yesterday with uh, men explaining why we uh, we don't uh, we we aren't having enough children. Uh, one guy, well, I can tell you the six feet, six figures, six inches mean meme isn't true. My wife stonewalled me at two kids. I have employees that have five. I think women are just weak. Yeah, that's the problem, bro. Yep. That's absolutely the problem. You know, it's women are stonewalling you with her with her uh, bodily uh, autonomy. Karina from Milwaukee has been waiting on the line. Good morning, Karina. Good morning. Um, oh, my. Oh, my. <laughs> well, you see, this is what it is. America has a 36th place on uh, newborn death. That means that every child out of a thousand is dead for no good reason. Uh, I would like to, I would like as a female, I would like to know that my child after nine months is actually have a chance of a survival. Uh, 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 in the, in the, in the, in the, in the hospital, besides the point that the times those men are talking about, those men were able to afford a life with one breadwinner and the female staying at home. Why would uh, a, a female go for a child with a nation who would rather spend money for a proxy war on the other side of the world than for a daycare? Why would I? Why would I do it and not even being able to afford the insurance for my child? Thank you, Karina. Really appreciate the call. Absolutely, there are so many factors involved in why people elect to only have one or two or three. You know, and 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 it's their business. It, it is their business, and it is their decision. Uh, one guy on this Twitter thread said, "You sound awfully judgmental about the private lives of others." Their marriage is between them and God. You don't know what goes on in their household. Could be fertility issues, trauma, et cetera. Just mind your own business. And the author of the post, oh, right, the old fertility excuse. 
A couple would go at it every single day in prayer and deeds so they can conceive. Health problems are a lack of diligence with no care about legacy. God is the one who shows favor with children. Less children means less favor from God. I think that's somewhere in either Ephesians or or uh, Exodus where it says, yeah, go go forth and get it on. I, I think you're changing that slightly. Well, he said get it on. I feel like he was <laughs> quoting the Bible. I mean, it's just, I'm just saying, you know, it's oh, the old, old, the old fertility dodge. The old, yeah, right. Uh, Gary from Sussex is on the line. Good morning, Gary. How many kids do you have? Three kids, and I'm very, very fortunate. My wife and I got married, and we tried to have kids, like, right away. We couldn't have kids. Uh, we went through uh, adoption, and um, a, a gal showed up at our church and said that she's looking for someone to adopt her baby because she didn't want to have an abortion. So we got the job, Jeremy which is now 44 years old. Oh, wow. And nice. then and then we ended up adopting our daughter, Jennifer, and she has uh, four kids. And then my wife, out of total surprise, gets pregnant. Aww. And uh, we have Josh, and then he has five kids. So we have a total of 10 grandkids. Look at you. Wow. Yeah. We're, we're very lucky. But I'll tell you something once. I heard before when you were talking to some of these gals that couldn't uh, conceive, we went through that. So you heard the versions of how the women feel, and I agree 100%. It's way harder on a woman. But as a dad wanting to have kids myself, I watched my wife cry every time she had her period. And we were hoping that you know she'd finally get pregnant. Sure, yeah. It hurt. It yeah. hurt. Oh, I believe it. And, and but, you know, not not as much as the women. I understand that. Of course, of course. But, but, uh, it well, hurts the men. For absolutely. Yeah. And I just don't, I I guess, Gary, I was just shocked by the judgment coming down from some of these guys on this Twitter thread about, well, you're a bad you're a bad person and God doesn't love you. If you don't have more than, you know, a dozen children, you're you're just a bad you're a bad Christian. And yeah, I, is- I, I think that kind of judgment. Being judgmental seems to go against most of the versions of Christianity I am familiar with. Yeah. But thank you so much for calling, Gary. Thank you for doing what you did, too. Absolutely. A lot, of, a lot of people won't even, like, we talked about this, I think we talked about this last week, where I said, and I believe this, if you are of certain means, of certain ability and access, it's your duty to entertain adoption as a way of having children, because there's so many children who need homes. I heard a, I heard a statistic yesterday, I want to I want to say in Waukesha County alone, there are 1,300 kids in the foster care program. I mean, so anyway, we're going to wrap up this more words from men segment with this comment from a woman on this Twitter thread. Is this a comment she put in amongst all uh, amongst the all of these? Yes. Right. Using your own arguments. Therefore, men who can't afford to raise an unlimited number of children onto single income are failing in their duties. Or is there no responsibility to feed, clothe, and educate them? on how to make an honest living, or is it just about the numbers? It's just as many as you can have, no matter what kind of situation they live in. What about impotence? Where does the Bible mention that? Oh, wait, it's probably her fault. And then they were like, burn her. She's a witch. Um, I didn't see that. I'll go back to the thread and Thank check you. today. She, I Please pro- follow up, I, I probably will. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that would be the comment. All right, I- coming up at 1033, we're going to be joined by the one and only Joe Zapecki is going to be here. The Supreme Court <clears throat> came out with a code of ethics yesterday. And we're going to take a little look at what that involves. And you know what, Greg? It doesn't the, involve us. It, That's a spoiler. It, no, it does not. And it also, as far as I could read within this document, uh, it also in, it doesn't include any kind of enforcement arm. So they're they're laying out all of these rules that they're going to follow, Mm -hmm. but there is no oversight on them to make sure that they're going to follow the rules they made to govern themselves. I'm sorry, listeners. I just want to apologize for Jane for a second. She's never heard of the honor system. So, (laughs) I mean, it's the your honor system really when it comes down. Oh, nice. Thank you. Oh, Greg Bach. (laughs) And then coming up at 1133, start thinking about it now, if you would. Johnny Watermelon, one of our colleagues here at Civic Media, is heading up to Deer Camp 
later this week. And he is going to share some fun deer camp stories with us coming up at 1133. If you have one that is arable <laughs> and relatively clean, we would love to hear from you coming up at 1133. You can always call and or text at 844-967-2789. All right, stay with us. You're listening to As Goes Wisconsin. This is the Civic Media Radio Network. Good morning. Welcome to As Goes Wisconsin. Jane met there in Port Kristen. Right. Calvin's on the board. Greg Bach with me in studio. And joining us on the stream, good morning, our friend Joe Zopecki. How you doing, sir? Hey, sports fans. Good to see your beautiful faces. Well, Jane's beautiful you. face. Greg's is kind of hard to find. It's hiding behind. You know what? Beard. There you go. How many kids do you have, Joe? Two. You have two. Uh, we were. That's how we started off the show. We were talking about the decreased birth rates in America, which has been going on for several decades. And then I stumbled on this thread yesterday on Twitter where men have all the answers on as to why women aren't having enough children. And one guy basically said that American women are weak. Wow. Um, yeah. I I'm not going to touch that, but I did see some <laughs> speculation that we have found the cure to this problem. Do you want to And hear? the cure is? If Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey make a baby, uh, that will provide the jolt to the birth rate that America needs. You think all the Swifties then will decide it's time for them to marry and have children? <laughs> those aren't those aren't my words. That was someone on the internet who is very excited about the uh, the relationship of our time. Those star-crossed lovers, those crazy kids, those crazy kids. It's amazing how many she's dated over the past almost twenty years in music. She has dated a lot of different celebrity guys, but this is the one. That's really sticking. This is, I mean, I, two months. I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. That's the wrong, I'm sorry. That's the wrong <laughs> choice. Words. Not sticking. This is the one we care about the most. Apparently like, no mean, one cared about Jake Gyllenhaal. No one cared about John Mayer. No one cared about Like they didn't care until after they broke up and she wrote songs about them. But man, we want this to work as a, as a country. Well, and I think there's two reasons for that. And I know this is exactly why you wanted me on was to offer my takes on popular <laughs> culture and Taylor Swift. Always. But, this, you know, this isn't um, that much of a surprise if you think back to her early stuff where she's writing songs about, you know, she's cheer captain and I'm in the bleachers. Yeah. And there, there's oh. always sort of been that oh. that sort of want, that feeling like she wasn't quite the cool kid, even though she's like the coolest kid literally in the world right now. Right. right. And yeah. so, uh, you know, my better half may have shared with me apparently uh, at a show this week taylor is playing with the uh lyrics to that song yes and saying like he's a chief's player and so like and then his face should lights up and it's just you know i you know what there is so much to feel down and depressed and anxious <laughs> and worry about the fact that any of us can hold on to these young lovers and you know hoping that these crazy kids make it and rooting for them god yeah. love it if you want some shots of of pure joy, get on Swift Talk or Instagram Reels where Swift is happening because it's just like, it's joy. It's fun. It's just, that's what's good stuff. Is it's, your daughter all into Taylor? Is she a Swifty? Uh, both my daughter and wife went to the, to the Swift show in Chicago. I nice. would say that my wife is more of a fan than daughter, but. <laughs> pretty close. But who's counting? Right. Pretty close. I'm sure your wife would be if you challenged it. Yeah. <laughs> well, she was I I was going to I suggested we go see the movie on Sunday. It was the last day it was playing and yeah. she was the one who was like, "I don't know, I'm pretty tired" because she went to see Kesha with our daughter the night before. Well, I mean, she's they're awesome. the cool good. They're the cool ones in this house if that <laughs> she wasn't also clear. saw it live. Like she I, I wouldn't I mean, if I if if I went to go see like my if you, like, "Hey, let's go see a reunited Pink Floyd in in concert." Like, "Yeah, heck yeah." I'd be like, "You want to go see in the theater now?" Like no yeah I saw yeah already. been there done that. i guess i could have gone by myself and so but to bring it all back uh yes the declining birth rate is both a national security issue and an economic security issue um i was doing some research about one of the things we're going to talk about uh which is donald trump recruiting for a potential second term one of the things that they are vetting for are people who want to decrease not only illegal immigration to this country but legal immigration to this country hey people you want to save social security and medicare we need more americans 
whether that's through the legal immigration process, whether that's through up in that birth rate, um, this is a this is a real a real thing. So it is a real thing. Away. Um, before we get to we're gonna we're gonna talk about Project Twenty Twenty Five in a little bit. I wanted to start off though with uh, the supremely hilarious uh, code of ethics that our Supreme Court released yesterday. So why do you say supremely hilarious? Because there is no enforcement arm. There is no there is no oversight body to make sure they behave themselves. It's just we wrote a bunch of rules to govern ourselves. And this is what we've always followed. We didn't I don't know. You've been bugging us. And now we felt like we had to write them down. And so we did. But, you know, just trust us because we're, we're we're fine. We're good. We're all good. So I guess my my question, my reaction would be, is something better than nothing? But it's still it's a nothing burger if nothing can be enforced. But here's what we've shown. We have shown that great reporting and transparency into what these justices are doing can change behaviors and the outcry over it can Mm. change behaviors. Hold on. In that. For 248 years is how long the Supreme Court has existed. There has not even been this. And now for the first time, even with their weird, annoying, obnoxious gaslighting, you know, introductory page, we've always lived by this. Like yes. that, that I'm here to, to dunk on. OK, but the fact that they have done this and put it to paper is progress. It doesn't mean that all of the problems are solved, but it is a step forward in terms of the court's operations, and it is now another thing with which to demand and hold people accountable. It's still going to take great reporting from outlets like ProPublica and others. It's still going to take probably the threat of the U.S. Senate and folks like Dick Durbin saying, you got to get your own house in order or we're going to do it for you. But I, I, I just I, I worry that when we jump to say it's not good enough, it's not great enough, it's not perfect. Since when has making perfect the enemy of the good been the right approach? This is this is something. Something is better than nothing. And, you know, it doesn't mean the fight is over, but it's progress. OK. I'll now give that, you now that they're it's... here to dunk on me. <laughs> no, it, you say it doesn't solve all the problems. This doesn't solve any of the problems because nothing's been solved yet. This is just a, this is a. Uh, it's a public relations stunt. Exactly. And to and, me. And a negotiation. Oh, 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 oh. When someone is held accountable, then I'll be like, all right, here we go. But for right now, it's a press release. That's all it is to me. Are they going to use these? Are they going to use these these things that they are putting forward in 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 their reform to hold justice accountable in what's happening right now? Great, then cool. I'm all I'm on board. I'm here for it. I want it to happen. But to me, it just seems like a PR stunt because all nine of them got together and said, "We're fine. We're good. We've been we've always been good. It's all good." Taking two hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars from a donor, it's good. And all I think this is going to do, Joe, is make them, some of them, even craftier about getting away with it. I think now they're going to have to be like, "Oh gosh, now they're actually kind of watching us." So we have to really do this on the down low if you're going to buy me off. Man, you guys have been beaten down. <laughs> <laughs> I write myself a note. It's right here. I look at it every day. You can't see it. But what it says is every day choose joy, hope, and optimism. At some point, we have to say, like, at least we're moving in the right direction as opposed to falling further and further behind. Uh, Like, if, if your expectation was that what accountability in the next chapter in this story was going to look like was that Sam Alito and Clarence Thomas were going to be shamed off of the Supreme Court and just no. go, oh, my gosh, you caught me with my hand in the cookie jar, and we will resign, and there will be two vacancies, and the U.S. Senate will put in place some ironclad, you know, thou shalt not series of policies, and that was going to be the next chapter of this. I, I think you um, I think you may have been expecting too much. A girl's I, got a dream, Joe. I had a ab- girl's got a dream. And this girl had absolutely no intention of thinking uh, that would happen at all. 
like I said, I want something to happen with them, whether it's even just like put a put a note in their permanent record. I don't know, but like I wasn't expecting them to step down from the bench, but I do expect there to be some sort of uh equality in its oversight that 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 the the Senate and the the House are maybe held to. I I don't see why there can't be oversight from other branches and I don't think it's I don't think it's um I don't, I'm not I'm not cynical about it either. I'm skeptical. I also like to choose joy and happiness and all those things. But when nine people say we're doing okay in the face of what looks like grand corruption, and all they do is say, "All right, here's here's the first step." Okay, where what? Here's the first step. Show me the next step. Then that's what I want to see in this country. Amen to that, brother. And let's so let's take the example, right? So all bodies, organizations have mechanisms of self policing. Right, that they're supposed to keep their own house in order. Sure. For example, Congress has ethics committees that are supposed to investigate their own members and police their own body. And when someone very special like Congressman George Santos comes along, the ethics committee launches a probe and they do an investigation and they have an ability to police their own membership as a body. And George Santos is still in Congress. So yes, there is also are outside actors that play an accountability role, the Justice Department. He's under indictment. That has, you know, that will play itself out in due time. So there needs to be both internal and external accountability when it comes to the Supreme Court, as there needs to be internal and external accountability mm -hmm. in all organizations. I'm just choosing today to say that the fact that there is now at least a document, at least some process in place for internal accountability may actually make it easier for there to be that external accountability for members of Congress or the Judiciary Committee to say things like, this is what you wrote down and put your name to, and now you are not living up to it. What am, what am I supposed to go home and tell my constituents so it can actually foster down the road some additional accountability? And it's, I'm just, it's a long road to get there, but at least we're now like on a path. Yeah. What I would say. I, and I think I'm, I think I'm in an agreement with you because you're seeing the next steps. Yeah. I, you're, you are, you are creating the next steps. I want to see them in real life and then I'll be, I'll get there yeah. to that point. But for right now. Yeah. I, I, I suppose it was a little much to hope for that Clarence Thomas would drive his motor home in front of the Supreme <laughs> court and just leave the keys Didn't, and, you know, and then, Two hundred and seventy-five thousand, a bag of two hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars in cash, and you know, giving it back. Well, you, you know, to the Harlan Crow. And, you, you, you are really good at being. You know, I have dreams. Yeah, I know. What I'm saying is, what you're doing right now is exactly what Joe told you to do. He told you to have hope. See, see, Joe. Okay, you, you won me over. You, you, you I, today. I choose optimism. Yes. In, <laughs> we did it. We did it. In, in this. Okay, in this moment, it probably won't last all day. It'll probably just be. It won't last till the end of the segment. What are you talking about, Jim? <laughs> yeah, well, she knows what the next segment is, too. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Oh, and did you hear the latest from the Whoop 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 Boing con uh, co conference? What no. happened in, in on, on the house in the house today? Oh. Oh, the shoving match? The shoving match. And the, yeah. a little, the little chasing back and forth between yeah, you know Kevin McCarthy and. Uh, uh, some guy like we've Birch, never heard of. Yeah, yeah, some yeah. some some other House Republican. It's a like greaser like, of the socias all over again. Greg's gonna be able to help me here, I think. There's yeah. some some movie that is like there's echoes in my brain of like, you know what the tough outsiders. guys do? You know what tough oh. guys do, right? Tough guys, and then it's insert, oh, you push people in the back when they're not looking when like, they're not what, expecting what it. Is that yeah. oh you're a tough guy? You want to be a tough guy? You know what tough guys do? Not what Kevin McCarthy did. The he's button. a big dude. If he if he knocked if he hit, he, I would fall over. Oh, he's heck, a tall. The, the reporter said that he. I mean, he shoved this other congressman right into her, and then he turned around and started chasing after McCarthy. So, oh, I hope that's on video. So, boing. I hope the listeners and viewers somewhere. not know how big Greg is. Greg, you are a bigger man than Kevin McCarthy is. He's taller. Stand than your me. ground. I think he's taller than I have a better center of gravity because I'm just chunkier. But he is like 
distributed well. Joseph Pecky will be with us when we get back. Stay with us. You're listening to As Goes Wisconsin on the Civic Media Radio Network. Good morning. Welcome to As Goes Wisconsin. Jane Matt there in Fort Kristen Bright. Calvin on the board. Greg Bach with me in studio. Joining us on the stream, the one and only Joe is a Pecky. Joe, let's talk about Project 2025. It's really pretty terrifying, isn't it? It's pretty bonkers. Yeah. Um, have you discussed this at all with the? We have not. This has been in the in the works for a little bit here. So Project 2025 is a plan by not just former President Trump, but the Trump MAGA wing of the Republican Party, which is to say a lot of it, almost all mm-hmm. of it, including longstanding organizations like the Heritage Foundation and others who are cooking up the next step of a plan that in the waning months of the first Trump administration, he tried to enact. And that was the largest change to the hiring practices of the federal government in, God, generations. I mean, you know, 70 years since this big a thing had happened. And this gets a little in the weeds. So I want to try to figure out how best to like explain to people what this is. And and I'll use my my own experience as an entry point for this. So perfect. I, I was a political appointee in Barack Obama's first term. So what that means is when Barack Obama was elected or when Joe Biden was or Donald Trump, they get to hire out staff, not just in the West Wing of the White House, but across the federal government. And there have historically been about 4,000 jobs there are two million federal employees right so you get to bring about four thousand folks with you from the campaign from you know the private sector who share your values etc sure and so like the agency that i worked at which was the small business administration which has employees on the ground in every single state across the country and territory at that agency of several thousand people there were like 15 to 20 of us tops, maybe not even 20. That were, Ob- that were Obama appointees. That were Obama appointees. And so, you know, our job was to run the agencies and try to uh, implement the president's agenda. And sometimes that ran into career civil servants and federal officials who would say, actually, you can't do that. And here's why. Right. Like it's the federal government. Everything goes through a legal review, um, you, you know. You are a federal employee. You are not allowed to politic on government time. That would be taking money from taxpayer, right? So, like, it, they have they set up the guardrails, right, Joe? Exactly. And listen, it it can be frustrating. I, I totally get that, but it's a really important part of protecting, you know, the the civil service and the bureaucracy and the, the government of the United States. So, what Trump. In, I think, October, like just before he lost the election, he tried to create a new class of uh, public servant, Schedule F, that what that would have done was made it easier for political appointees and the and the president to fire civil servants who would essentially have removed their protections that they have through their unions and through established protocols and procedures over time. So, for example... If I, as an employee at SBA, said uh, we want to do a loan program that gives out, uh, you know, um, loans to businesses that display an Obama uh, sticker in their window on the door, like a Better Business Bureau thing, but instead it's the Obama hope signal. Sure. And And if an attorney said, no, 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 you can't do that. And here's why that I could just go or someone could just go. Well, I don't like that answer. I think you're wrong, attorney. So you're fired. And I'm going to replace you with someone who shares my belief in, you know, and my politics. And that's messed up. Well, it's essentially making sure that you can do whatever it is you want to do, whether it's legal or not. Correct. And so 4,000 is what it has been in terms of political appointees. The estimates are that this Schedule F would apply to 50,000, 50,000, so more than 10 times as many officials throughout the government. That is um, 
that is problematic for a number of reasons. Um, you know, among them, and I was looking at this has been great reporting by Jonathan Swan from Axios, is that, you know, these folks are saying that they're being, this is uh, Swan's reporting, prescriptive about what gets a person on the list. Yep. They want applicants who want to cut not just illegal, but also legal immigration into the United States. They favor people who are protectionist on trade and anti-interventionist on foreign policy. They must be eager to fight the culture war. Credentials are almost irrelevant. So you don't have to be qualified to to be an appointee. You just have to agree with their ideology and you're good. Uh, apparently. And so what they're doing is coming up with lists of people who meet these particulars, you know, thousands and thousands of names who are ready to go day one. And they are being quite candid that they don't expect that they'll have 50,000 names ready to go should President Trump be reelected or you know, get elected a second time next November. What they're saying is that the, the mere threat of being able to fire these officials and replace them will kowtow them into doing what they want. So in the hypothetical I dreamed up, uh, as opposed to saying, you can't tell me I can't do that, I'm going to fire you, because that staff counsel goes, oh, my God, if I don't give him the answer he wants, I'm going to lose my job uh, and my livelihood, that that will uh, that will pressure them to say yes more readily. This is really dangerous and very, yeah. very frightening. I can't think of anything worse than the president of the United States being surrounded by nothing but yes people. You yeah. need some I mean, you need someone to to can talk truth to you if. It's just wrap your heads around this, folks. This is really bad. He no longer has those people. And so this is also from this reporting from uh, Jonathan Swan. Trump has reduced his circle of advisors and expunged nearly every former aide who refused to embrace his view that the 2020 election was stolen. He spends significant amounts of his time talking to luminaries of the Stop the Steal movement. Daughter and son, daughter of Anka, son-in-law Jared are no longer involved. Um, you know, one former senior advisor notes that January 6th was the crucible and that the treatment Trump meted out, especially to his own vice president, changed the landscape. Even if you're a true believer, you see what happens to people. This is Joe, we're messed gonna have to, up. Yeah, this is messed up. And we're going to have to have you back so we can do a longer segment about this and really explain just how dangerous this is to our democracy. But anyway, thanks for carving out some time. Joe Zapecki, really appreciate it. Say hi to your lovely wife from me and stay with us coming up. At 11.06, there is a new scam the Better Business Bureau wants you to know about. And we're going to talk about things. I've, I've fallen. I've fallen. I've fallen for scams. one. I probably fell in for more. So we'll, we'll take your calls as well. Stay with us. You're listening to As Goes Wisconsin on the Civic Media Radio Network.